my name is Virat along with my colleague others and today's topic for the webinar is to introduction and to basics and architectural patterns of IBM security verify access which is an access management solution from IBM so let's start so the agenda for today is to give you a brief context about what is the IAM domain and IBM has a suite of different products uh, which is basically a verify portfolio. So we'll make you aware of what all different services provided by different products in to take care of the business needs around the IAM. Then what are the major challenges faced by the organizations who doesn't have the uh, mature identity and access management solution to manage the user identities in their environment? Then we'll go more deep into the product level where we'll discuss that how ISVA, uh, which is also known as the IBM Security Verify Access, can help you to mitigate those challenges. Uh, then what are the different components of the ISVA and what are the different architecture patterns available which you can leverage? And ISVA appliance has the clustering feature which helps to take care of the high availability and the failover uh, to make sure that your services are up and running all the time. So we'll explain more in detail that uh, how that feed clustering technology is supported. Then we'll also talk about what all different platforms available where you can deploy the ISVA. And at the end, we'll take you through the some of the integration packages available on the IBM App Exchange portal, where you would find multiple different packages to integrate ISVA with third party applications. What's the IAM, right? So every organizations have their own security policies to secure the sensitive data. And one of them is to securely manage user identities. There are different types of identities such as workforce or you could say the employees or consumers which are the actual business users or the business partners. It is essential to protect associated user accounts and entitlements based on different roles assigned to employees based on their job duties. IEM provides a framework to securely design and implement those security policies. And in many industries, it is requirement that you have an IEM solution to meet the compliance. IEM basically comprises of three main segments identity governance and administration, access management and authentication. And the third one is the privilege access management. So let's understand this uh, domains in brief. So the first one is identity governance. So it helps to manage the workforce or consumer identity and user account lifecycle management. Basically it helps to automate the complete security process where you do the complete user experience from identity onboarding, account provisioning, managing access entitlements, and offboarding once user leaves the organization. Next is the privilege access management, which helps to protect the privileged user accounts. For example, you may have the root user accounts on the Unix servers, then the Windows admins. You may have the multiple database which stores the customer sensitive data. So you have the DBA credentials, right? So traditionally, IT operations staff share those credentials among themselves, which is a bad security practice. PAM solution allows you to provide secure access to all IT resources without sharing the actual account credentials. And at the same time, it also does the session recording for all the activities being performed on all the servers. So if there is any security breach, then it's easy to investigate those security incidents. And the third one is the access management. It helps to securely authenticate users using stronger authentication mechanisms and provides access to protected applications securely. It allows organizations to define the authorization policies for different applications and allow access to only based on the valid authorization. Nowadays, organizations have highly fragmented environment. Most of them work in hybrid cloud, right? So which comprises of enterprise applications deployed into their own data centers. 
they may have the cloud workload on multiple public clouds along with the SaaS applications. And this decentralized environment has increased the attack surface for the hackers. Malicious parties thrive in this decentralized environments to gain access to unauthorized sensitive data. Organizations with not enough mature IEM solution in their IT environment faces many challenges. So let's understand those challenges. So the first one is the operational efficiency. Obviously, op operation staffs may not get the full visibility across all the user identities and associated accounts to different applications across whole decentralized IT infrastructure easily if they lack the, any identity management solution in their environment. And the user experience. Users may have to go through different applications through different URLs, right, to access, and they may have the use the different user accounts, uh, which may lead to poor user experience. And the auditing or security incidents. Without centralized authentication and authorization service, investigators may have to audit each of those applications manually and rely on audit capabilities of those affected systems, which may not be reliable. Next is the weak authentication mechanisms. So without centralized authentication service, users may have to log into different applications separately with different credentials, and many of those applications doesn't support the advanced authentication mechanisms and can open an attack surface for the hackers. And the last one is the IT support cost. I mean, this is the very most common uh, cost to organizations because they might need the help desk if they don't have the centralized authentication and the uh, solution in their environment because users may request password reset, right? So, and it may lead the productivity as well. So now let's understand what are the top three challenges faced by the organizations if they don't have the good IEM solution or the program in their environment. So the first one is the identity bridge. So as per the IBM survey in 2023, the average cost of security bridge is almost around $4.45 million and enterprises face a significant challenge with constant threats such as phishing and credential stuffing attacks. Attackers now log in using stolen credentials rather than hacking the system itself because it is easier for them to bypass all the security checks, right? If they perform the login to gain the access to the customer data. Then the next is users can't identify phishing. So you, you do receive many emails, right? User do click on many of the unwanted links. And this causes the data breaches for the organizations. And almost 40%, 41% of attacks leveraging phishing techniques targeting employees and their company's customers. And just to rely on human vigilance to prevent phishing attempts isn't enough today. Technology needs to play a critical role in detecting and preventing users from unknowingly sharing their credentials with attackers. An effective IEM solution can incorporate advanced fitting phishing detection and prevention mechanisms to provide enhanced security and protect against such attacks. And the last one is complexity in the enterprises. So almost 84% of organizations have immature identity and access management programs. And the main reason for such a large number of organizations are having the challenges because of the complexity of the available tools in the market, stakeholders, then the aligning business goals, obviously the skill shortage as well, and the budget constraints. Now let's understand if you have the IEM solution or especially the access management solution in your organization, then what are the benefits you gain? So obviously it's a centralized authentication and authorization, so you have a better vis visibility on the access to your applications. That means IT operation staff and the IT security team have the full visibility and they can easily monitor the whole infrastructure to manage the user identity and the authentication and the authorization while different users access different applications. Then you can easily apply the security policies centrally across all the applications. 
and obviously it's going to improve the user experience because user just needs to log in once and through the single sign on they can access all the applications seamlessly so it also improves the productivity now let's understand the ibm security verify portfolio how it can help to meet uh, meet your business needs around iam so ibm has the two kinds of solution one is managed another one is unmanaged manage is the saas service so you don't have to manage the infrastructure ibm takes care of the infrastructure and you can just purchase the subscription of the saas service and just simply directly use it and manage means you have to take care of the, your in infrastructure it means you have to install configure manage and maintain in your own data centers so ibm's identity as a service solution uh, which is the ibm security verify saas it helps organizations to modernize and achieve hybrid identity and access management implementations while also providing lightweight governance from the cloud it includes consumer identity and access management capabilities as well to help and build the backbone of consumer identity strategy for organizations with the need of an on premise solution can leverage ibm security verify access it can solve advanced access management use cases while also fitting consumer identity use cases IBM security verify governance includes robust identity governance capabilities as an on premise solution and finally IBM security verify privilege offering which includes both saas as well as on premise deployment option to secure privilege user accounts and all these products are supported on premise public or private cloud and also as a container or in appliance form so there are plenty of options where you can deploy these products and use it now let's understand the key features of the isva but before we go into the key features let me just highlight that ibm has been recognized as a leader in the latest gartner magic quadrant for access management report published recently so these are the key features of isva so the first one is the single sign on obviously it's like you just authenticate login once and access all the applications irrespective of it's on the saas or on premise applications right you can seamlessly access it so that's a key feature of the isva then the next one is the adaptive access traditionally we have a static predefined access policies to allow deny access adaptive access typically refers to a security approach that dynamically adjust the access permissions based on various factors such as user behavior context and the risk levels instead of relying on static access controls adaptive access system continuously monitor and analyze user activities device information they use to connect to the application as well as the location data and other contextual factors to determine the appropriate level of access for example if a user typically logs in from a specific location and suddenly attempts to access the sensitive information from a different country or using an unfamiliar device the adaptive access system may trigger additional authentication steps or even block the access altogether until the user's identity can be verified and the next is the passwordless authentication also known as the passkey or fido key it's the open standard and it's being adopted increasingly by different organizations because it's the phishing resistant authentication mechanisms so it's very hard for hackers to gain access to the application if it is protected by the passkey then there is the open x banking support uh, basically it uses the advanced access control module capabilities of the isva it allows the financial institute to share the data with third party applications on behalf of the user to innovate financial services for their customers uh, just to give an example insurance company can suggest different plans by simply referring the bank statement of the user provided the user has authorized the insurance company to access their bank statement and the mfa support 
So for the second factor, authentication is very common nowadays. So there are plenty of different kind of uh, second factor authentication mechanism supported by ISV out of the box. Uh, we will look into those different mechanisms in subsequent slides. It also helps to have a centralized monitoring and auditing. So if there is any secu security breach, right, then the security investigators can easily look at the audit logs, logs to find out which user logged in from which location and access which all applications. And next is the API security. Nowadays, all the application loads uh, usually in the cloud uses the microservices. And this microservices based APIs are everywhere, right? And it requires a secure communication to communicate with each other. Even the mobile apps or the single page apps, right? They call the microservices based APIs. So you can leverage the advanced access control module capabilities available in ISVA to secure the API authentication and authorization. And the last one is the federation support. So it provides the single sign on between different unrelated domains organizations using open standard protocols. Nowadays, all the SaaS applications in the market uh, allows the single sign on using this open standard protocol. So it can be easily integrated with uh, any of the access management solution. So now let's first understand what are the different use cases you can implement using the different components of ISVA. So first one is the reverse proxy, right? So reverse proxy, it's a high performance multi-threaded web server. And usually it sits between the public network. I mean, where the actual business users or the application users reside and the, the enterprise application uh, to authenticate users securely. And based on the authorization checks, it allows the access. So it provides the wide range of built-in authenticators uh, out of the box. So you can simply enable those configuration and use it like form-based authentication. You can use the client-side certificates. You can use the RSA security token. If you are having the uh, Windows Kabaros based single sign-on, then you can also le leverage that and OAuth is also supported. Some customers want to use their own authentication so in that case, they can leverage the external authentication interface uh, available on the reverse proxy. So which will redirect to your own authentication module where you can authenticate and revert back to reverse proxy with the authentication session information. Next is the, as this is the uh, reverse proxy sits and protects your enterprise applications, then it also helps to enforce all the fine grain authorization security policies you may have configured in your environment to protect different applications. And these access policies could be group based access time of the day, or it could be, you know, based on the different IP address or network zone. So those are the policies you can configure and apply it. It also supports the web application firewall, and uh, which is based on the open source web application firewall called mode security. It helps to real time HTTP traffic monitoring and detects the attacks so that ISV admins can take appropriate access, uh, action if they find such attacks. DS Boxy also supports many different kind of SSO mechanisms. Organizations looking for the access management solution which just not work with modern applications but also easily integrate with legacy applications available in their own data centers. And DS Proxy has plenty of options to achieve those. So these are some of the authentication mechanisms like GSO, LTPA key, JOT, client header, right? So once user authenticates, reverse proxy can pass on these tokens to the backend applications and the backend applications can consume this token to allow the uh, secure access without any additional authentication challenge. Now look at this visually, right? So let's say you don't have any access management solution in your environment. So obviously users has to go to different URLs to access the different applications and you may have a different kind of authentication supported by each of these apps. Now you can just imagine the poor experience uh, it creates to the actual users, right? Now, once you have the access management solution in your environment, you can have the ISVA proxy sitting in between the users and your apps, right? And users can leverage the uh, out of the box authentication mechanisms on the reverse proxy. 
once user authenticates, then it can do a single sign on across all the backend applications and you can choose one of the supported SSO mechanisms based on what kind of applications you are integrating with the reverse proxy, right? And obviously reverse proxy will enforce all the policies before it uh, just to make sure that the user is authorized to access those applications before forwarding requests to the backend. And the next module is the advanced access control and uh, the main use of this advanced access control module is to enable your environment to use the latest second factor authentication mechanisms. So it would be very difficult for hackers to go into your system uh, and you know stole any credentials because even if they get the passwords it's hard to bypass the authentication with the second factor so some of these uh, uh, authentication mechanisms available are the pass key which we just explained before right it's a passwordless authentication and it's phishing resistant mechanism so most of the organizations use that nowadays then the risk based MFA, which is a context based access. It uses different attributes like location, IP address, then the transaction details to calculate the risk score. And based on risk score, it allows or deny the access to the applications. For example, if user try to access your online banking from outside country and initiate a money transfer transaction, right? Then the MFA can be initiated to confirm the identity of the users. Transactions with lower amount may be allowed, but can be customized as per the business needs. So you can configure all these different kind of access policies in your environment. It also supports all kind of soft tokens like different kind of OTPs, HOTP, TOTP, email based, SMS based, voice based OTPs. It also supports the mobile multi-factor authentication where you need your mobile, you need to register your mobile devices first as an authentication factor and it requires the push notification uh, can be approved or rejected either through the face ID or you know the fingerprint to allow or deny that transaction. And IBM Verify has the IBM Verify mobile app which is available for download on the iOS and Android. It's the enterprise level mobile application and it's available for free so you can easily use that uh, to enable your access management through the uh, mobile multi-factor authentication mechanisms. It also supports the OAuth and OpenID and that's like, you know, for example, just for social login authentication, you don't need to create an account on all the different applications. You can access multiple portals without even creating user accounts on those applications provided they support this OpenID Connect, right? So say for example, uh, you can log into Facebook and access other applications by simply providing a valid authorization. And it also has authentication policies workflow. Okay, so it means that you can have your own custom workflow where you can define what what is the flow of the authentication, which all different kinds of authentication mechanisms you would like to have in your workflow before allowing the access. So this is just one example. So similarly, you can have any customized workflow as per your requirement. Uh, the federation use case, right? So federation module will help you to integrate the um, non uh, unrelated entities. I mean, say if you want to integrate, you have some of the SaaS services and you want to do a SSO between your on premise applications with the SaaS services, then you can just use this open standard protocols like SAML, WS federation, or even the open ID to integrate uh, with those applications to provide the single sign on. And you can do this between SAML protocol specifically requires some sort of uh, trust between the two different entities, right? So uh, it requires sending the SAML token from the identity provider who is basically authenticates getting the user and proving that this user is legitimate and the service provider will consume that uh, identity through the SAML token to provide the single sign on. Federation module also has this web service called security token service. So it helps to exchange one type of token to another type of token. So say for example, if you have this ML token, but your backend applications requires JWT token, right? So 
you you can leverage this swap service which will help you to convert one type of token to different type of token so that you can forward it to your integrated applications and they can consume those tokens to perform the single sign on so some of the uh, tokens supported uh, for the exchange are saml jot module kerberos module iv cred module right so you can leverage that as well now let's understand what are the deployment components quickly so verify access, right? So basically the main component is your LDAP, which is basically the user registry. ISV appliance comes with the embedded LDAP, but uh, it's not recommended if you have very large production load. It's okay for the uh, very smaller number of user deployments in the production. Uh, otherwise, recommendation is to use the external LDAP server. Then the uh, database. Uh, so ISV appliance also comes with the embedded DB. Again, it's the same recommendation that uh, it's a closed box appliance, right? So you don't have direct access. So better to use one of the supported external DB. Uh, it the DB is used to store the transactional data, for example, session information for the federation flow, then the registered devices for the multi-factor authentication, all the access token granted to different uh, mobile devices, right? So all those kind of short-lived data are stored into the database. Policy servers helps to configure the different access control policies, and it can push all the latest policy changes to all the clients like reverse proxy and authorization server. Then the reverse proxy, which I already explained, that it it sits in front of the integrated applications and authenticates user first and allow access to requested applications based on valid authorization. Then the AAC and Federation Runtime, it's a, the uh, Java Liberty based app. It helps to uh, use the capabilities around the advanced authentication mechanisms and different kind of Federation protocols. Then the next one is the DSC, Distributed Session Cache. So it's the centralized session storage for the reverse proxy as well as the other components like AC federation runtime for high ability. So now let's understand that if you deploy these components, then how it would look like uh, this is a standard architecture. So uh, basically all the requests will come uh, in the data tier. You have the data which are more sensitive, uh, like the user repository. So you can use one of the supported user registry. Then for the session caching, you can use the distributed session cache, which is the proprietary component. Uh, if you wish to use uh, Redis as an external session cache, which is more scalable, more faster, then you can also use that. Another option is that you can use the uh, database as well. Uh, so you can use any of the supported uh, uh, database in your environment. Uh, so usually what happens is that when user access the application, it comes to reverse proxy, reverse proxy, uh, creates a different junctions that we call as a term, which will basically point to different traditional applications residing in the customer's data center. So based on the junction name, it will route the request to the backend application and performs the single sign on. And uh, AAC and Federation uh, module will add on the capabilities around advanced authentication mechanisms and the Federation protocols. Now let's quickly understand what are the benefits of ISV appliance clustering. So appliance is easy to uh, easy to set up. Uh, if you have the hypervisors, you can just set it up within you know 10 minutes. You can get the access to the admin console. So appliance clustering helps to achieve the uh, uh, high availability for different components, and you can have a multi-master uh, clustering. We support around total four master, we call it as primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, and you can have as many non-master nodes as you want. So all the configuration usually uh, you can do only from the primary master. So it replicates all the config change to rest of the cluster members. So policy server basically runs only on the primary master as in active mode, and it's uh, in the standby mode on the secondary master. And if you want to make any policy change, then you need to make sure that uh, primary master is in healthy state and the policy service is running fine. Uh, then you have the database, embedded database uh, for the config. Config DB will store all the configurations like what are the access policies you have configured, 
different API definitions around open ID, OAuth, right? So all the configurations information will be stored into a config DB. And the runtime DB will have the uh, transactional data, which are the short lived data. Uh, so the database on the primary master is in write mode. So all the write requests will come to that and it would make sure that it replicates the data to across all the cluster members. And you can see that uh, the supported services for around the DB is specifically based on the role assigned to each of the appliance. Then distributed session cache can run on any of these four masters and it pro provides the support for auto failover. So even if primary master DS is down, uh, the services will continue to run and serve the user traffic. Reverse proxy and AC federation can be deployed on any of the master nodes or you can have any non master node as well. So you look at some of the architecture patterns in the subsequent slides, which will give you more idea on that. Right, so here's just an example for illustration that suppose you have two data centers and you want to install the ISV appliance cluster, then what are the options you have? Okay, so you can follow different approaches, but this is just a most commonly used uh, uh, deployment we are just discussing. So for the LDAP and DB, you can have the HA at the whichever LDAP or the database you use, uh, right? So you can have the use its own capabilities for the high ability. Uh, from the appliance perspective, you can have the primary and tertiary in the data center one and then secondary master and quaternary in the uh, data center two. And uh, that is, you can have non master node like the restricted node here as an example, because you want it would usually deployed into the DMZ network zone where actually all the public traffic will come to that. So you want to make sure that it doesn't provide more access to your appliance configuration or the ISV configuration. So here are the uh, different components which are running on this each of these uh, appliances. So restricted node will host the reverse proxy and it will take care of all the incoming traffic from the public network. And um, in the primary, it will have the policy server, distribute session cache and AC federation runtime. And similarly on the secondary master as well. Now it's not it's not uh, uh, necessary that you always need the secondary master on the data center too. If you think there is a network connectivity issues or between two data centers, then you may have the secondary master as in primary master and you can move the tertiary to data center too, because it's essential that the network connectivity between data center is always established because primary master needs to push on all the latest config changes across all the cluster members as well as it replicates the data if you use the embedded DB or the embedded LDAP server. Uh, you can also use the container deployment. Uh, we suggest either you use the OpenShift or any Kubernetes platform. Uh, so you can have a multi node environment where you have, you know, say for example, uh, you need from the ISVA perspective, you will use the config service, uh, which will be the initial container you will deploy. Uh, because it allows you to provide an access to the web admin console uh, so that you can do all the necessary configurations like creating reverse proxy or the AC policies, federation definitions. Then you have the DSC service, which is for the session storage. And as it, as I mentioned earlier, it supports up to four replicas. So you can have four different nodes where you can deploy it. And the AC and federation runtime, and it's the scalable service. So if you think that the existing four or five pods are not enough to uh, achieve your performance requirement, then you can have additional node hosting the runtime service. And similarly for the reverse proxy, right? So that is also a scalable service. So you can uh, have as many pods as you want to make sure that you can access uh, all the different applications protected by reverse proxy and uh, you can achieve the expected throughput. And the deployment platforms. So it's a wide range of platforms supported by ISVA. Uh, you can have the virtual appliance, uh, which is very easy to set up. It's the, it supports a wide range of hypervisors like VMware ESX, Microsoft hypervisor, Red Hat KVM, Citrix hypervisor, right? And if you have some regulatory requirement, then you can also use the hardware appliance as well. 
And these appliances can be deployed in public or private cloud, uh, or if you want container, then you can also deploy it. And one more thing is that I just want to highlight that these products are available on the AWS and Azure marketplace as well. So you can simply log into your corporate account and you can just go to the catalog and you will find those softwares available for you to simply use it. And um, you can use your existing licenses with those uh, appliances on the Microsoft AWS cloud. 